So I'm going to talk today about making learning memorable. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about e-learning or traditional, mobile, social, whatever kind of learning, we often don't focus on what is probably the most important part is that people are going to remember it a week later, a month later, a year later. Are they going to remember it? Are they going to use it? Most of you, I would guess, are not from the pure academic uh, world where they just want to know for knowing. And even in the academic world, we want students to remember it past the exams. And let me tell you, they don't. Because in the university and in the actual world of application, people don't really remember most of what they learn. They may pass an exam immediately after, but if you check a month later, a year later, do they remember anything? They actually remember very little. And if they remember, they don't apply it. It doesn't impact behavior. And at the end of the day, why do we teach people? Why are we doing all of this? So this is a point that has been neglected, a point that we don't pay enough attention to, but I put forward to you today that it's the most important issue or a critical component, but it's very complicated. So I'm going to talk to you today about making uh, learning uh, memorable. Uh, my name is ETL uh, Dror, and I spent my time at uh, University College London where I do basic research, but I'm a person very much down to earth. So I don't want to talk to you only about theory and ideas. I want to talk about very, very practical ways of making learning more effective, more memorable. But what I present to you is grounded in cognitive, in theory, in understanding how the brain stores information. So I'm going to talk about all of that. I have only uh, one hour with you, which is a short time. So I have my email and a lot of information is also on the World Wide uh, Web. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, it's nice. I gave the keynote here four years ago, and since then I, I gave two or three other talks. So it's nice that uh, people are coming back again and again. But uh, for the sake of those people, I'm going to present new material. So you're not going to hear what you've heard maybe in the past. It's going to be uh, almost all new. And that's very easy because usually I give two-day workshops, 16 hours, so I can pick out different materials. But it's not only that, I also want to present new findings, things that were not known a few years ago. So it's new material, new findings that I want uh, to talk about. I will have a bit of repetition to give the overall framework that uh, I've talked about in the past. Okay, so a cognitive uh, informed approach to increasing memory and the impact of learning. So I'm talking people remember, <clears throat> memorable learning. Well, what does that mean? First of all, it means that the information, the skills, is in the brain and accessible. So a lot of what uh, we teach doesn't go in the brain. People really don't acquire it because we don't have enough understanding of cognitive load. There's too much information, they don't take it on board. And even if it gets in the brain, it goes in one ear and goes out the other ear, it's not stored in the brain. And even if it's stored in the brain, it's not accessible to retrieve the information. So first of all, if you want people to remember, you're giving them a memorable experience, whatever you're trying, whether it's information, knowledge, skills, it needs to be stored and they need to access it. And it needs to transfer because even if it's stored and even they can access it, you want to transfer from the learning to actual workplace. So maybe they remember the information a year later, but they're not actually using it when they need to apply it. It needs to transfer from the learning to the application. And we want it to generalize. So you don't want to teach one option. They apply it, they remember it, it transfers to exactly that situation. <clears throat> but we live in a world that changes. We don't want to retrain people all the time. You want them to be able to generalize and to apply it to a wide range of settings and applications that need at the workplace. So it's not only about remembering, it's about transfer and about the ability to generalize it to many situations. We do that by creating the right mental representations. If they have the right mental representations, then it's stored well, it's accessible, they can transfer and generalize it. 
And for example, two things that I'm going to focus on today, you want salient mental representations and you want flexible ones. Now, all this kind of stuff really is determined initially in the learning when the information is acquired. And many times, I will show you today very practical examples, a small change in the acquisition during the learning that doesn't cost more money, that you think it doesn't really matter, has far-reaching implications to how the brain stores the information, whether they remember it, and how they're going to use it. So if you want them to access it, transfer, you want all of this, you need to give them the right learning experience, thinking about all of these issues. And usually people say they remember my talk because I bring with me a human brain, so I actually have a brain. I didn't bring it uh, today. I, I don't think I need to apologize for that, but uh, I bring a human brain because the human brain is what is very important because people see a lot of information. There's a huge cognitive load in many of the presentations, e-learning, mobile learning, too much information. The brain has limited resources. It can't take all this information on board. So you need to think about cognitive load, and what you need to remember when cognitive load, we're not only talking about the material itself that surpasses the resources of the brain, and you can be Einstein, it doesn't matter, you have limited resources, but usually most of us, not all of us, but most of us, unless you're an academic, have a life. So you're learning, but you may be thinking about a test that you did, a medical test, whether you have cancer or not. Maybe you're worried if the stocks are going up or not. Maybe you're late on your mortgage payment. We all have other things in our life going on, and all of this occupies our brain that has limited resources to process information. And you look at the brain, we have all these mechanisms that are critical in how we store the information, how we encode it, and if and how easy we can retrieve it and it will affect uh, our behavior. And it has limited resources. So we need to think about that. Try to load too much information, you're going to be an ass in the air, like this donkey. The brain can take it. You can teach it. You can show it. The people who are listening and are paying attention, and some of <clears throat> your clients may be very motivated. They work with motivated people, surgeons, pilots, police officers, or they're less motivated, and they work also with young people who need to learn, uh, you know, literacy, numeracy, they had bad experience in learning, they're, they're anti before they go. It doesn't matter. You can't just load because this was the objective. This is the material you have uh, to cover. Let me give you a simple example. I'm going to put uh, on the screen a text. I'd like you to count quietly how many times the letter F appears on the screen, and I want you to write it down. So how many Fs do you see here? And write it down, please. I'm coming to check, so I want to make sure you're doing your task. <clears throat> What's your name? Zach. Let this speak up. Zach. And how many do you see? Three. How many people see three? Pick your hands up. Almost everyone. There are six. Don't pick your hands up. I didn't ask you. I'm telling you. <laughs> there are six. <clears throat> so everyone who saw three, almost everyone, and some saw four or five, rarely people see six. Are you blind? Let me see if I can see the Fs. You can't see, you can't, what's wrong? First of all, let me show you six, so you don't think I'm fooling you. You can see the three Fs, F, F, and F. Everybody sees those three, but it's of, of, and of, right? Ah. <clears throat> Should you go and change your prescription? Should you quit your job? You're trying people who can't count? No, this is an illustration of the limited capacity of the brain that the brain filters out information, whether you want it or not. And we bring students into the lab. We offer them one pound for every F they can see. They're very motivated. One pound is pizza and a happy hour beer. <clears throat> and many, most will see three, maybe four, not six. Because the brain, you are experts in reading, and you know of a the is not important and you automatically don't read it because you're wasting limited resources. That's what makes people intelligent. The more intelligent you are, the more you don't listen to people, and the more you don't pay attention. You are an expert. 
and picking out the information. And that's why very smart people do very stupid things in the expert domain. They have a whole paper on the paradox of intelligence and expertise. <clears throat> but this is an illustration that you need to think, what is the brain going to take on board? What is it going to perceive? Is it going to encode it? And is it going to remember it? And to do that, you have to look and understand the mechanisms of the brain. And even if I brought a brain, we don't have enough time to explain the human brain, because I can talk about it eight hours a day for a few years, and I know very, very little about the human brain. So we're not going to do that today. The question is how to make learning memorable. And the answer is easy. We don't do it. It's easy when you know how the brain works. You know what are the memory systems. You know the capacity. You know how to represent information in the human brain. And the most important thing is to translate it to practice. I went to the exhibit hall. I don't want to embarrass any company. I took some pictures and brochure. Many of them have brain and diagrams of the brain. Beautiful ones. I want to use them. They're better than mine. But when I ask them, okay, how does this relate to your product? Not only they can't answer me, they don't understand the question. <laughs> they just put it because there's a lot of more psychobabble. Now there's a lot of brain babble. So people like to talk about neuroscience and the brain. And then they jump to their product, their applications, to the practicalities, but there's no connection. The idea and the most difficult part, which I enjoy doing, is taking understanding the science of the brain from cognitive neuroscience and translating it, and I will show you examples today, because I don't want to talk about theory and not show you practical stuff. The shoemaker should not uh, be barefoot and to translate it, but this is the important part, and then it's easy. And we have done such a good job that we have done too much memorable learning experience that were too memorable. So how far do you want to go? Do you want to make the learning experience what you want them to remember, that they'll remember this, they'll forget everything else, like a song. Sometimes, you know, a song gets stuck in your head, you think about it all the time. Do you want to go that far? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, depending on your application. But we have an ability to make things extremely memorable extremely powerful and very, very strong. How important it is for them to remember? Sometimes it's not very important, so they don't remember. Then they ask somebody next to them, whether they're on the job. I did a project with a mobile company called Orange, very big mobile company, to train the people they need to learn the tariffs and the products. And they change every few weeks, every few months, with new mobile phones. When you go to a store, not only uh, Orange, but Vodafone, O2, any of them, and you say, I want a phone. Can you compare these two phones for me? What do they do? They start reading the specifications. I say, look, I, can, I don't want to be rude, but I can read probably as good as you, or I want to buy a TV in Curry, compare these two TVs. They just start reading because it changes all the time. So the question is, how do you train well? But in this case, it may not be very important we want to make them learn, but it's not critical that they remember because they can always read, they can ask somebody else. Sometimes it's super important. And I'm going to start with the very extreme, and then we'll move to the more uh, subtle and less extreme, when something is rare and critical. I did a project with B&Q, big company, if you're not in the UK, uh, of DIY hardware. Then in the big stores, they cut wood for you to your size. So you don't want them to cut their hand. It's not something, okay, they will learn, they forget, they cut their hand, they've learned. No, it's something rare, but critical. And sometimes in the information that they must remember, you cannot make a mistake, and it's very, very important, and they must remember and do that. And it's very important to do it in training when it's rare, because it happens rarely, but when it happens, you need to know what to do. For example, in the medical domain, pediatric a cardiac arrest, if a child or a baby had a heart attack. It happens very rare, but when it happens, the pediatric needs to know what to do so the child doesn't die. So they need to do a memorable experience because they're not going to see it in practice, maybe once every few years, but they need to remember to deal with it. And also you need a very memorable experience in the extreme when it's a demanding job, like a police officer. They come to a scene, there's lots of things going on in the medical domain. There's a lot of resources that are in demand in the brain. So they forget everything because there's a lot of things going on. 
the brain has limited resources. It's all competing on their attention. A police officer coming to the crime scene, there's a big fight in the pub, everybody's fighting, they don't know what's going on. It's very hard to make sure that at that moment they remember the important things that they need uh, to do. So how do we make it memorable? Especially in cases like this, the extreme cases. You need to ask yourself, when do people remember? When do people remember things? So in your life, when do you remember? This is a question mark. Things in your life, professional, personal, what do you remember really well? What kind of events do you remember? What makes a experience memorable? Emotions. Emotions, okay. Emotions is very, very good. And negative emotions are the best, right? Also good emotions. But basically, when something goes horribly wrong, a traumatic experience, when you've made a terrible mistake, this makes events extremely memorable. Things that you do not want, that you can't afford to happen again. The power of mistakes and error in learning. <clears throat> Let's go back a few millions of years ago. You or your kid or your friend ate a fruit that's poisonous. They ate it and they died, or you ate it and you almost died. If you don't remember it, you are going to die next time because you're not going to get lucky. So you need to remember those terrible danger zones. Some of us don't. Well, they're not here right now. That evolutionary branch, they died. <laughs> so we're here because our brain has the mechanisms. If something goes wrong, you need to remember. Let's go back millions of years. Let's go just a few thousands of years ago when we were in college and university, when we were teenagers, right? Don't tell me about yours, and I won't tell you about mine, but we all had a traumatic date. One traumatic date is a date from all the wonderful dates that we remember and maybe modified our behavior so we're never going to go out with women again or not going to go out with men again. A traumatic event we remember very, very well. It makes a strong imprint. Or if you can go currently, I talk to my students, and I say to them, you know, a paper is due, please, don't come and tell me that you're not handing the paper on time because your computer crashed. Save. Every 20 seconds, save. I don't care, save, because if the computer crashes, you're going to lose all your material. Do they save? No. Until one time, your computer crashes and you lose something. You may lose something small. It doesn't matter. You burn, you feel it. So, um, I live in England. They have a British passport, but... I speak a bit directly, so you may want to put it a bit nicely, but I want to utilize this for learning in the extreme cases. Burn them. Sabotage. We have a technique called sabotage, a whole methodology. We have a paper on that. We've applied it now in the medical domain. When you build the learning, don't tell them what they need to know. Sabotage, so they make a mistake. So they're having a negative emotional Again, I'm overstating it, so we'll find a nice way of saying A traumatic experience, then you're going to make it memorable. And, of course, you're going to calibrate it as appropriate, depending on your application and, of, and depending on your audience and depending on a lot of stuff. But you want to have an emotional, an error, a mistake experienced that they will experience on something that you want them to remember. Let me give an example that we've done. Anesthesiologists must learn to manage emergency, unanticipated, cannot intubate, cannot ventilate airway when people can't breathe uh, uh, unexpectedly. It's a rare event when you cannot intubate and not ventilate, but you need to know what to do, and if not, it can be uh, fatal. And there's a very classic sequence and algorithm developed that they're all trained and they all learn they begin with a ventilation mask and a laryngoscope. So they try a mask. That doesn't work. They try a laryngoscope. Usually that's enough, and that works. And again, we're talking about an emergency, unanticipated, life-threatening condition here, so there's a lot of stress, a lot of things going on. But sometimes this doesn't work, and then they need to insert more uh, serious tools with inflating parts. And if that doesn't work, they really need to do what is called the chirothyrodotomy. 
So basically, uh, if that doesn't work, they will uh, put it more serious stuff. And if not, they'll have to really make an incision and uh, put a tube in so the person uh, can breathe. And that is very extreme. It's rare, but it is needed. The problem in training is that they don't do it when it's needed because it's a stressful situation, it rarely occurs, and they get stuck. Tunnel vision in the first, first or second or up to the third uh, stage. And we wanted to make a memorable learning experience for the anesthesiologists. Uh, and there's different ways of doing it, but we did a study. I'm happy to send you uh, the paper. The normal training, only 9% will use this. We did the training when we gave them a bit of kick in the butt, a bit of a small trauma by not doing it, and they remembered it, and they remembered it well, it went up to 75%. However, and that is a danger, it was too memorable, meaning it was strong, the 75% who used it, used it too quickly. They're not supposed to use it, because that's, they forgot everything else, they remembered it, and they too quickly didn't go properly in the sequence. So you have to be careful when you don't have any memorable experience to give them too much of a memorable experience and then they use it all the time. So you need to calibrate the mental representations. The most extreme, and I started with the most extreme, is making them have a mistake themselves using a technique I call sabotage, setting, it, setting them up for a mistake, setting it up that it's going to be a problem that they need uh, to remember, and you can do it in any domain. For example, uh, if you train in customer service against somebody trying to steal products or using fake money, not very common, but instead of telling them, check that's a 20 pound bill or 50 is not fake or check the signature, doing training, tell them that, and after you train them, in the training, put in, without telling them the counterfeit money. And then, if they don't catch it, then say, what's happening? You know, you didn't pay attention. You haven't seen it. And they'll, again, you don't want to emotionally traumatize them. You don't want to bring them up and embarrass them in front of everyone. You're an idiot. You can't see Fs. What's wrong with you? But depending on what you need to teach and how important it is. However, you don't need necessarily to go to the extreme, which I started. And now I'm going to go and make it more and more subtle to give the emotional error experience. And then I'll talk about other examples. So you can see errors in other people. So this is an example of an interactive video that we've developed for road safety and properly doing road surveys. So it's an interactive video. So people watch it. OK, you put your name. And you have to see mistakes that somebody else made. A bit less traumatizing. You can put a bit of humor in here. So, oh. Double parking on a double red line, that's uh, not very good. So we have many of them, they work in different ways. Then you can put here parking on double yellow line. And it will remember it on the top right. He's not putting the handbrakes. In a minute, the car is going to start moving. No, wrong, it doesn't have the proper, the, the proper shoes on. Uh, not wearing proper shoes. And we have a whole variety of them in terms of health and safety in a laser laboratory, the medicine. And it goes on for one minute, five minutes. It's interactive. We have ones that you get multiple choice questions when you find it. And you get scores, how well you do, how well other people do. And uh, when you're done, it will give you a score and it will tell you the ones that you missed, all the issues that were wrong and you haven't noticed. But this is kind of, rather than you uh, getting the experience of having mistakes yourself, you can observe mistakes in uh, other people, which is an emotional component, you pay attention, uh, and it's all good, but it's a scale a bit less than you having the mistake, so you can, rather than you making the mistake, uh, in something they see a video or you do a simulation or whatever, and they say, oh, something is wrong here. You know, he's not 
putting on the safety goggles is not or whatever you're trying to do. Or if you're just selling a product, you know, he didn't tell the customer that they can get this great warranty where you pay twice the cost and for five years, you, if you lose it, they'll replace it or whatever is important for your uh, application. The issue is not telling them, but having them have an emotional related experience. It can be a trauma, it can be just seeing, uh, burning them, making a mistake, seeing mistakes, or, and I'm getting more and more subtle, what you probably do quite a lot when you make it in an emotional context. So you tell a personal story that you involved, this happened to me, and my mother was going to die, and luckily the doctor remembered to do this procedure, and something to get the audience involved, some context. And sometimes it's even true with the stories. You can make them up, but it doesn't matter. The idea is to put it within an emotional context that people remember. And that's much more subtle to give the knowledge an emotional component. It attracts attention. You remember there's a lot of things going on in your learning. There's a lot of things going on in people's lives. They have limited resources, need to grab the attention of the cognitive system. A lot is going on. Two, it makes salient, long-lasting memories. Three, it encodes the information in episodic memory. A lot of the training we do, people encode in a memory system that's called semantic memory. The different parts of the brain, different cognitive systems, semantic memory, again, this is the not a whole hour, but a whole semester in university, just memory system, but semantic memory is knowledge, where you organize things by meaning, semantics, and episodic is more your personal, emotional, autobiographic experiences. So you want to get it not only into semantic memory, but in addition, into episodic memory, because that's what the emotions are. And this connects very much to things that many people know, and now because the Nobel Prize Winner Daniel Kahneman wrote a book, Think Fast, Think Slow. If you're familiar, there are two different decision systems in the brain that control our behavior. One is experiential and one is analytic. And we train a lot the analytic system, and people may remember the analytic system, but when they go and behave in everyday life, a lot is governed by the experiential system. So to make a memorable experience, that they will not only remember, but apply and change, you want to store the information and to have it affect people's behavior in the experiential system, because you can train them from here until tomorrow, how, what they're supposed to do in the law, but when they go out to the field, they're dealing with a customer in a crime scene, their behavior is going to be mainly controlled by the experiential system, and all what you train them is not in that system not going to work. They may sit down and write it, but it's an experiential system that you want to address in addition to the other system, and that is giving them an emotional experience, something, not only the knowledge. And this is only one thing. Halfway through, I'm just warming up. So stop when I have to stop. But how about surprises? You need to surprise them to grab attention. And I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your foot or your toes, probably with everyone's toes. I evaluate e-learning all the time. And every time I evaluate an e-learning, it starts. Here is the objectives of the e-learning module, and then you say, I want to shoot myself already, I'm going to hang myself. God, it's boring. Before it starts, I've disengaged. And I'm really motivated because they pay me quite a lot of money to look at it. And it's painful. Do some surprises. Everything is anticipated, the brain ignores it, like the F. It's not carrying any information. You say it before you start, you say it in the end. This is what you've learned. By the end of the module, you'll know this product, you'll know to do the... God, this is so terrible from a cognitive, memorable experience. I'm not saying, say what you're going to say, repeat it in the end. Do it, but do it differently. Do it something that they haven't seen, something that they're going to look at it, rather they know. At university, many times I start the semester, I come with a tie and a suit. Sometimes I come with sandals and shorts and a ripped jeans. They say, this crazy professor, what's going to happen next class? Before I go in, they all say, what is he going to do today? It's really weird. They're, I have their attention. Rather, they're all boring. They come in, 
pay attention. They know not to pay attention in the middle of the class because in the beginning is the most important information, and in the end so they text and whatever they do. A bit of surprise, engage the cognitive system. You have to do it because the system has limited resources and it doesn't want to engage. You need to control the cognitive attention. There's very little, and you're competing with their text and their family life and their crisis and their finances and their hemorrhoids or whatever is going on in their life right now. And we all have a life that something is going on uh, that you need to. So you don't have to give them an emotional experience, a trauma. You can burn them. It's very strong. They lose the file on the computer. They will know. So have all your students work on a paper and artificially cut down the electricity. They'll all lose a file if they haven't saved. Then they will remember. Telling them again and again and again is a waste of time. But you don't want to go to that extreme. You don't need to go to that extreme. Depending on your application, it could be surprise. So there's some involvement of the cognitive system, and fun. So emotions don't have to be negative. You can have fun. Fun is good. Fun is also an emotion. And I will not talk about gaming, because gaming is, again, another whole uh, lecture. But take a simple example, not medical surgeons and skills and police, which is very easy because everybody, they love doing gaming, right? They like to play around on electronics. But even young kids, take a game like Twister, if you haven't if you don't know what it is and you had a deprived childhood, I can tell you later. But it's a fun, common game. And why not change it? Teach them continents, where the different oceans are, in a game of Twister. Then you're having fun, but they're going to remember that uh, the Pacific Ocean is on the west of the America. Then the Atlantic is between Europe and America, or whatever you want them to learn. But you remember I told you about the anesthesiologist. Don't make it too memorable. Don't traumatize them too much. The same thing with games. Quite a lot of time, make sure they don't have too much fun. I see gaming things. They're great. People love them. They play games. But the game is so wonderful. They don't remember what they've learned. They had such a great time. Remember the games, the fun, the emotional experience, whatever you're using is not a goal by itself. It's a technique, a tool, an instrument to involve them, to get the cognitive system to pay attention, to acquire information, to meet your objectives. So all of this, I've just talked about how to make learning memorable, how to make a mental representation. Now I want to talk in the remaining time, first of all, about how, what is an optimal mental representation, how we make them. And then I'm going to talk about transfer and to generalize uh, what we're doing. A lot of information I'm covering, but I'm trying to make it memorable for you. Okay, so you need to train people. For example, this is work I've done with uh, Air Force to identify aircraft. And they need to be able to identify aircraft. It's very important. And the top two, uh, depending on but I'm talking about the top two are friendly, the bottom two are not friendly. This will be an F-15, F-18 manufacturer in the United States. This will be Russian, used by the Syrians, our latest. They move every few months, we have different enemies, so it's the Syrians or the Malis, whoever we're dealing with now. And there, I picked these four because they're very difficult. Some planes are very, very easy to identify. These ones are very, very hard because they're very similar. And I'm not talking that it's doing a battle and you're upside down. Even if you sit here comfortably, it's very hard to identify them. And what you do, what the brain does, without you being conscious at all and knowing and aware, picks up on the specific characteristics that are for each aircraft. The same thing when you meet identical twins, they look the same, but as you know them, suddenly they look different. No, they don't look different. Your brain has learned what is specific and unique to each one, and that's how you identify. And you may not be aware that your brain is looking whether the left nostril is bigger than the right one, because that distinguishes Dave and John. That's what the brain does in learning. The same here. After a lot of exposure, you see that the F-15E model, the air taker, is a right angle. It's a unique feature. The nose is identical for all four. So it's not information that's going to help you 
know the difference, but the air taker is. So what we said, let's help the brain acquire information by exaggerating, by making the things that make them unique, like a caricature, we want to use cognitive optimizing for learning. So just like each politician, you know, they emphasize something that is unique to them. We can do that. That's kind of a cognitive, clever way to make a mental representation that's efficient. And what we've done, we have a paper on this, helping the cognitive system learn, exaggerating distinctiveness and uniqueness. We're doing training. We enhance the specific things that need to be learned. And it's not only with pilots, even if you teach people how to code information on the computer, and there are very important things, like the semicolon or the syntax or how to talk to a customer, the important part of what they need to learn, you can artificially exaggerate it to cause the right mental representation that pays attention, that the, it's salient, and that increases the learning, but not only the learning, it makes it memorable and they're going to apply it better. Of course, when the pilots go to the battlefield, they're not going to see exaggerated aircraft. They're going to see real aircraft. But we measure their performance on air-to-air -air combat simulators on real aircraft, and the people who studied and the exaggerated aircraft outperformed the other ones. And the details are in the paper. It's on my website. But this is just one example of what you present. Also, the order. You will be surprised that the same information, the same example, you can present in different order. They learn totally different things. The first thing you show makes the mental representations, and the next ones modify it. And if you give it in a different order, the final outcome is different. I have a lot of experiments where we manipulate this. The examples you use, why do you use this example? Oh, I think it's nice. No, you have cognitively optimal examples that you want uh, to use, and a whole range of things of the way you present. For example, orientation. Again, with uh, Air Force, I've done a lot of work that they have to identify the F-15E. You exaggerate the air taker, but which orientation are you going to present it during learning? You can't present it in every possible orientation. There are an infinite amount. Which one does the brain like? That if you show it in that orientation, they're going to remember it better than any other orientation. The brain likes this orientation. There's a scientific answer, and again, we have a paper on that. Most of the work I do with the Air Force we can't publish, but this is two examples when we talk about the optimal, and we use other, and we test how well they remember later, and you find huge effects. And it's also chunking. People chunk information together to make it more efficient. How do you want them to chunk it? how to use color, texture, whether to use audio, what audio, text, what fonts, do you want to use images, what images, do you want to use a table? All these questions are critical if you want them to have an optimal mental representation that they're going to remember and use. And on each one of these, I'm more than happy to talk for a long time, but we don't have much time to do that. The bottom line, it's all intended to grab cognitive attention and resources to minimize the cognitive load and build a mental representation in here. And I've shown you some very, very practical example of trying to make it brain friendly. If you want to make it memorable, it has to be brain friendly. What about that it transfers and generalizes to the job? So I'm going to talk about that right now. And I'm... I'll try to leave some time for questions. OK. So I'm moving now. We talked about how to make a memorable experience, error, surprise, fun, optimal mental representations, a few examples of what you do, what you want to do. But now we want it to transfer from the learning. Not only they remember, but it transfers and they're going to use it, and in a flexible way. So first of all, learning context. The learning context is extremely important. If you present things during learning in the same context during retrieving, they're going to remember it uh, better. So when, what in cognitive terms, the context of retrieving is similar to the context of encoding, then you'll find transfer. When they have to retrieve it, when they need to remember it, if that is similar to the circumstances of what they learned it, 
they're going to transfer. We call it encoding specificity, context-depending learning, a lot of fancy cognitive terms on this phenomena for transfer. And I'll give you a few examples. Number one, environment. If I give you a test in three months, in a year's time of what I talk today, and you will sit in circles, in tables in circles, or you will sit in the same sitting arrangement. If you sit in the same sitting arrangement, you will be able to retrieve more information. Just the way you were sitting, whether you're sitting in rows, the arrangement of the desks and the chairs, if it's the same. So if you are tested in this room sitting like this, you'll remember more versus another one. Noise. We want people to remember if there's noise, so you don't have to talk about an operating room or police officer, a store, whether you're selling a product in a supermarket, whether you're training people to work in a call center, there's certain background noises. If they learn with those background noises, then when they're working with the same background noises, they're going to transfer the information. Sound. If I'm going to give you a list of items to memorize, and then I'm going to say the items, and you'll say, is it on the list or not? Not now, in a week's time, if it's the same very unique, weird voice of mine, you're going to score much better versus Clive, who speaks very posh, proper British, is going to read the list because it's a different voice. And if you give it to a female voice, they're going to remember even less. What is it relevant? So it doesn't matter. It's critical. The fact is they're going to remember more. Then it gets more interesting. Uh, clothes. So... If you're a surgeon, I train you, they don't like it, with gloves and masks. If you work in a bean queue in orange, wear your uniform. Yes, if you learn with the same clothes that you're going to use, while well, you're going to apply it, you're going to apply it more. I'll give you two more examples to see how extreme it is. Intoxication. I'm going to train you, and I divide you randomly to half, and I'm going to train you in a skill, learn how to tell you, you know, to operate a cash register machine, learn some new mathematical formula, whatever skill it is. Half of you, before the training, I'm going to offer you compliments of learning technology, vodka, martinis, getting you all intoxicated and measuring that you're all intoxicated. And you are sober. You get a orange juice and milk as a control condition, and we train you. And then an hour later, a week later, a month later, a year later, we're going to test you. Intoxicated. Now we get everyone drunk. You're going to remember much more because you encoded the information, drunk, and you retrieved it when you're drunk. Similar context of intoxication. So you're going to outperform the group who learned sober. It's unbelievable. So under drunk condition, if you learned, then you need to do that. That's why we want to train police officers walking you know, having their heart rate up, not sitting and having coffee and drinking a cup of tea. The circumstances when they need to remember certain things, like we train them. I work, I train them at police and others. When you go and see a person, you look at the eyes. Police, when they go to a crime scene, what do they need to look at? Not at the eyes, at the hands. You have to train them because that's whether it's going to be a gun or a knife or a fist. And of course, I'm tying up things I've learned. You can exaggerate it during training. And you can traumatize it when they don't look in the hand and they get stabbed because it's a beautiful face smiling and they're not looking at the hand. So they feel it in a simulator and you can combine the information. But the, it's critical. And the last thing that I'll mention, a huge amount of scientific literature is mood. So if I'm going to, I can put people in a good mood or a bad mood. It's very easy to do uh, experimentally. I can tell you later if you're interested. But if doing retrieving you're going to be happy, and you learned it when you were happy, you're going to remember it better versus if you learned it when you were sad. And vice versa, if doing a trivial, you're going to be sad. If you encode it sad, you're going to remember more. And that is many times, I'll explain to you something that happened to you probably, when you're sad and in a bad mood, suddenly you remember lots of sad things that happened to you. That's exactly the reason, because of a retrieval of the context. You're sad, so suddenly the retrieval and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the learning context, you have to think very, very carefully what is the learning context in terms of what context you want it to transfer to change and impact behavior. So you don't do the classic mobile social learning, e-learning, not. 
where you don't think about it, they acquire the information, they learn, great, but they're not going to use it, and you are, why aren't they using it? They know it, is these kinds of issues. Last example of uh, learning context, divers. They used to train divers how to fix oil rigs, and then they went to the oil rigs and they forgot how to fix it because they trained them on land and they had to retrieve the information underwater. And there's a lot of research where you look at memory performance. If they study it on land and test it on land, they do very, very good. If they study it, uh, which one, this one, study on land, so you have test and study. So if they're tested on land, and they studied on land, they do very, very, very well. Here, they, stu they study underwater, and they're tested underwater, they do very, very well. But if it's the opposite, it doesn't matter. You train them underwater and test them, vice versa, the context. And that's why they don't only train divers now, but astronauts. If you've seen TV, where do they train astronauts? Underwater. Because when they go out to space, there's less gravity, and they're trying to imitate it as much as possible. So there's a lot of learning uh, implications of that. So that's the learning context. The other two that uh, I'm going to mention is utilizing top-down cognitive uh, processes. So the human mind is not a camera. Don't think that the human mind is a camera. We are very sophisticated and active. We use a lot of things that we know, that we expect to remember things and to transfer them. For example, if I ask you to guess what is the last letter here, most people will say K. But it can be an R or a K by the information, but W-O-R-R -R doesn't exist. W-O-R-K does exist. If I ask you to guess what the second letter is, most of you will guess an E. Even though it can be a C, it can be an F. But why CAD doesn't exist? Why FAD doesn't exist? But you know what? Why EAD doesn't exist? But you have READ and HEAD and DEAD and READ. So the brain is very flexible in using similar. We're very flexible and active in using our past experience. So do I have time for this demo? Because I'm talking about memory. I want to give you a list and to remember things. No, I'll leave time for questions. So next time we'll have a demo that I'm not going to do now. It's a demo to show inferential reconstruction. This demo, which I would make you happen, people, when they remember things, when they learn, you don't encode everything. It's a waste of time. You encode certain parts, and then you infer. So if I tell you, I was last week, oh, I went to a conference and I really behaved like an idiot in the evening before. I drank lots and lots of alcohol and the next morning I was throwing up. I'll tell you a long story. You're not going to encode all the details, just a few things because you know the scenario. And when I ask you later, tell me what happened, you're going to add information that typically happens. For example, I may not say that I had a headache. And you will say, he drank too much, he threw up, he had a headache. And you say, yes, he said it. No, because you don't encode all the facts. You encode the typical scenario, and then when you recall the information, it's called inferential reconstruction, and I was going to make you do that in a demo, and you can do it another time, where I'll ask you to remember things, and then I'll ask you to write down what I told you, and all of you are going to say that I said something which I did not say, because it's typical to the context of what I'm going to say, but I'm not going to say that piece of information, and because the brain limited resources, you take a lot of shortcuts, and later you infer what you think I was going to say. The mind is not a camera. You don't just encode things like the letters uh, F. And the last thing that I'll talk about, because we have uh, eight more minutes, so there'll be time uh, for questions. You want flexible representations that they can apply in a variety uh, of ways. The way you learn it is the way you're going to use it. A demo I have for this, I challenge anyone here unless you've been to my talk before I know this, to say the months of the year by alphabetical order. Anybody want to do it? If you haven't done it before, I don't want you to cheat. I will give you 20 pounds if you can do it. Does anybody want 20 pounds? Obviously, you get paid very well. <laughs> anybody want to try? Going once? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
You haven't heard this before. I haven't heard it before. What's your name, please? Bill. Yes, Bill. Here, Clive will hold the 20 pounds, so don't change my mind. <laughs> Take as much time, but don't help him, anyone, and don't write. First of all, do you know the month of the year? Tell me the month of the year. January. You know it, right? So the information is here. It's not a lack of knowing. Okay, so let's start with April. Good. Uh, December. August. Oh. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I've done it to thousands of people. I haven't met a person who can say April. August, December, February, January, July, June, March, May, November, October, and September. It's not that I'm smart and can do it. I just memorized it by alphabetical order and encode it in a different way. The way you learn things define the way you can use them later. So here's the classic example of information that you have, but you have no flexibility. You have a very rigid mental representation of the months of the year. You can't Use it differently, even though you know the information. And I'm not asking you to be creative and you do a different operating procedure. Just the months of the year by alphabetical order, it's a trivial task. No, you sleep in the bed the way you make it. You retrieve information and use it. They're not flexible unless you do it. You need a certain learning experience and you need to think if you want people to have a memorable experience and that it will transfer and that it will generalize to many situations, you have to think about it during learning. And I'm asking a lot. I was only going to talk about how to make a learning experience memorable. I want it memorable, optimal representation. I want it to affect behavior, to transfer to the workplace in a flexible way. And these are things that you need to think about, and you can get it right if initially you give the right learning experience. Let me give you a very, very practical example. Learning to write Letters in English, kids learn at uh, elementary school, primary school to write letters, cursive. You can teach them in a way that they will learn very, very quickly by groups of similarities. So I'm going to start in teaching them A, K, L, B, D, and F. They're all very similar. You have this loop going up. So this is new, new stuff. They learn very, very quickly because once they learn the H, then it helps in the K and they help one another. Once they learn all of this very well, very quickly, you teach them another set of very similar letters, A, E, C, A, U. They're all very similar in writing. And they learn that very quickly. And then G, J, Y, and P, because they have the loop underneath, et cetera, et cetera. So you teach them this way, you learn very quickly, you get an award for effective training, the kids learn the letters real quickly. But later, you test a year or two later how well they write words. They write very bad, connecting the letters, because they acquired very rigid representations, like the months of the year. If you do training, H, A, P, you mix them up. They're very, very different. It's very hard for the brain to learn it. Harder than in the sets. So I'm not getting any award, because it took me twice as much time for the kids to learn the letters when I mixed it all up. However, they acquired flexible mental representations, and when they need to apply all the letters to all the letters when they write words a year down the line, my group, even though it took them more time to learn the letters, are going to learn much faster to connect the letters into words and more flexibility in doing that in the group that learned it in a certain way that is more efficient. This is a classic example, and I have many, many examples of that where you get a cognitive trade-off between the learning and the application. So you have to think of the applications, that how you want it to transfer, and how you want them to generalize. So to make it transferable and to generalize, I've mentioned a learning context, utilizing top-down cognitive processes, and flexible representations. There are more. There's plenty more. We can sit here until this evening and go more, more examples. The examples that derive from a scientific understanding of how the brain represents information and translating to very, very practical ways to make learning memorable and effective in terms of remember it, using it to transfer and generalizability. So we talked about making it memorable already. We talked about transfer and to generalize. We talked about giving people kind of a, a trauma, burning them in an extreme, all things, all things others or giving emotional context a bit easier, 
talking about surprise, something engaging. Don't tell them what is the learning objectives, exactly the same in what they've learned. Having fun, not too much fun, and using clever, sophisticated way, exaggerating uniqueness. And how do we make it memorable? As I said, it's easy when you know how the brain works and can translate it to very practical way grounded in science. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Itiel. We have just a little bit of time for questions. Anybody here got a question for Itiel? Uh, right at the back, there's a gentleman. Hi there. Um, yeah, I'm just interested whether you've had any experience of getting managers of people to adopt some of these principles, because we know, of course, that most development happens in the workplace. So how can we get managers taking some of these principles into the workplace to develop their teams? There's always good foot soldiers wanting to do the jobs, and the general not understanding or only caring about money and workflow mm -hmm. in many of these uh, domains which is an uphill battle. I would say two things. First of all, by taking these principles, you have a very good business case. Because I'm not saying spend more money and use some super technology. No, the same technology, the same thing you're doing now, make it much more effective. Hit the nail on the head. In this financial situation, we can't afford to spend money on training that's not memorable, that people don't use it. We're wasting money. So there's a very strong business case, number one. Number two, drop me an email, I'll send you some demos, show them that they can count the Fs, show them the gorilla example that you're probably familiar with, and a few demos, so they experience. I work a lot with the police and the pilots who think they come, they have big egos, to say the least. So they have a hostile audience, and you have to bring them on board to show them that they get in fixation error that patients die, that they shoot the wrong people. They don't like to hear it, so you need to use demos and illustrations to show them what you're talking about. And in addition to saying that that's a quality that you want to do in training, there's a good business case that they can get more for less if they understand the cognitive system, they can hit the nail on the head. That is in terms of how to sell it to management. Okay, and another question? Anybody? Uh, right down the front here. You promised a difficult question, so I'm, I'm worried. A fun question. Um, you've talked about how to make learning memorable. How about how to make learning both memorable and so it works in a way to ready them to rely on some of the cognitive aids to which they often turn now, their phones, their tablets, whatever. So taking the practicality of those devices as part of the context into account as we're building our programs. If I understand your question, is how do we use all this technology to do memorable experience? No, actually it was how to make memorable experiences that incorporate the fact that they will most assuredly be looking to their aides to help them remember, mm -hmm. to help them perform, to provide them with advice. So the question is how, so to, if use you're a good it, how, how to use technology to help them remember and make it memorable and to work with it. Right, and how to build that into, the, into learning so that we're not pretending they have to remember everything. You told me a difficult question and you haven't disappointed me. <laughs> uh, the answer is what is the best way to what we call offload cognition onto technology. I have a book called Distributed Cognition, how we can expand the mind through technology. So there are ways uh, to do that, and the ways to do that, I, I'd be happy to talk to you to send you the paper in the few seconds I have. You need to think of the optimal ways, and you need to think when they do that, what cognitive abilities they are losing because they're downloading them and they're going to lose. And we can argue if they need to know how to look at a map in GPS. Do they need to learn how to spell when these automatic spellers? Because when I learned to spell, I had looked in a dictionary. I didn't want to look twice, so I memorized it. Now it's a waste of time to do that. And those issues, so we have to worry about. And B, what is the optimal cooperation between the human and the technology to making them work together? And there are ways to do it 
in terms of understanding what are the strengths and weaknesses of the brain, what are the strengths and weaknesses to the technology. The brain is very effective and very bad, and technology is very effective and very bad in certain things. So rather than them competing, you want them to work together by understanding what are the relative advantage of the brain that you don't want them to use the technology because they're losing things, what things the brain has limitations and you want to use technology that can really, really help. And then we can sit on specific examples and I have uh, two papers on that and even in the 2013 yearbook on science and technology, I have exactly on human cooperation where I talk about three levels of cooperation. One is when you offload, so the technology is subservient to you. Two is distributed cognition where the technology are your partners, you're collaborating. And the third one is when you're subservient to the technology, when the technology takes the lead. And which one you want to use for which example, for which situation, depends on what we need to do. But it's a very critical question. And whether we like it or not, we need to think about it. Because people in conferences say, oh, my kids don't talk anymore. They text to me. They don't have a conversation. Well, whether it's good or not, I'm not saying, and it's not simple, but I will say that whether you like it or not, they're going to use those technologies. So we want to make sure they use it in the most effective way for learning and for development and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to bring us to a close because I'd like us to finish on time. And I would like to thank Itio once more for a very stimulating session. And there certainly are some things I am going to remember from today's session, and I hope you. you too. So I'd like to just uh, thank Itio one more time. We could.